Good morning, I'm Martha Minow. Uh, I see some people I know and people I don't know. The people who are sitting in the way back, I get it, I've done it, I'm gonna beg you to come forward. You, you can sit on the edge, we promise we won't notice when, if you leave. So just please come a little bit forward because otherwise it's hard to have the conversation that we are very much hope to have. Um, welcome to the 2019, 2019 AALS annual meeting. Uh, this is a uh, continuing part of the President's program, uh, the Law and Reconciliation program. A CLE attendance sheet is located in the rear of the room, and if you sign it, the ALS will verify your attendance at the program for CLE purposes, but the ALS can only verify your attendance if you sign the sheet, so please refer to the sign-up sheet for more details. We value your feedback. Please complete the session survey found on the uh, ALS uh, mobile app. Um, and boy, you're coming forward. You're making my day. This is fabulous. OK, we're going to have a conversation. Well, hi, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Thank you so much for having for, for the, what I know is going to be a great conversation because we've already started to have one. And I thank you to Wendy for the idea. Uh, we are in the theme of building bridges, and we're thinking, I think, very uh, much in con con continuation of the wonderful opening session with Justice Cameron about the role of law in particular. Uh, in societies that are divided, societies that have oppression and histories uh, and ongoing uh, patterns of division, what can law do? Uh, and we're also thinking particularly about legal education and what are our obligations uh, and possibilities as educators. The topic, law and reconciliation, uh, also introduces some concepts like restorative justice. Uh, and in contrast to restorative justice, what? Retributive justice. So I thought one place to start is what do we mean by that? And when each of our wonderful participants speaks, I'm going to ask you to say your name and to say just something about your identification. I will just say this is the most amazing group of people who are theorists, activists, who know from experience, who have their hands in the work that we're talking about. And uh, that makes me very excited to be here. Margaret Burnham, I've just said your name, but you can say your name and, and your identification uh, and your, your work is stemming from before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, your ongoing work uh, on issues in this country. Can you help us know what do you think we need to understand is the meaning of restorative justice and compared to what? Thank you so much, uh, Martha, and thank you so much, Wendy, for uh, pulling uh, this together as uh, one of the uh, central themes of the conference, uh, how we uh, use our um, ability to teach students to uh, restore justice and to uh, redefine justice. Uh, the uh, talk this morning was uh, incredibly illuminating, as were the questions, and in particular, I was uh, struck by the questions about uh, why uh, law is uh, both sufficient and also completely insufficient uh, in, in as much as uh, South Africa is uh, still defined as perhaps uh, the most uh, acutely uh, uh, racially uh, polarized uh, capitalist country in, in, the, in, the, in the world, and those two things are connected, uh, and yet it has been uh, a leader its courts uh, and its uh, lawyers and its, uh, its conceptions of law and justice have really um, transformed the thinking and, and the work of all of us across the globe uh, on these issues. Um, I direct a program at Northeastern, shout out to Northeastern University School of Law, uh, <laughs> which, uh, which we uh, describe as uh, the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice project, and I use um, the term in the broadest sense, not in the uh, in term of art sense of you know, restorative justice as it's used in schools and courts um, to bring together um, two disputing parties or a two harmed party, a perpetrator and a victim, uh, but rather in the sense of what would it take to restore uh, justice denied uh, to uh, communities uh, at, who were uh, held in the grip of subordination and marginalization in our country. 
So I use the term in that much broader sense, right. and I try to uh, both work with my students uh, and get them to incorporate um, these notions of restorative justice uh, as they learn law and as they practice law uh, through the cases that we work on, which are uh, racial murders and lynchings uh, in the mid 20th century. And uh, let me just give the shout out to the website, which I think is superb also. So Linda, can I ask you to uh, amplify, uh, offer your perspective on the meaning of restorative justice? and say you something about yourself as well. <laughs> thank you, Martha, and thank you, Wendy. I am very excited to be here with this marvelous panel. So uh, it's been uh, terrific to get to know you at least a little bit on the, on the phone and to learn about your work. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work in the past. My name's Linda Meyer, I'm from Quinnipiac. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of work in the past on prison reform, criminal sentencing, uh, and the jurisprudence of mercy. And so I've come to think of restorative justice as really having a different picture of what it is to be human. Um, our traditional picture of, of what it is to be human in a kind of social contract mode is individuals who are rational, who make contracts uh, and have free will and are independent of each other. And we think of the, the justice system as a kind of huge balance sheet, you know, taking some, some, uh, something from this side and giving it to the other side. It's a zero-sum game. There are winners and losers. And the ideal is for everyone in the little Excel sheet uh, boxes to have the same as everyone else. And I think that the restorative justice movement has a very different picture of, human, and, uh, of what it is to be human. And I, I want to talk about just two features of that. The first is that we are all dependent, primarily dependent, not independent. And Martha Feynman's work uh, it has been transformative for me, as well as you know, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, in rethinking the human character as just all the way down dependent on culture, our language, our milieu, our traditions, all come from outside of ourselves and are part of us. Uh, and we need each other. Um, and Mark's work also in terms of thinking about the way in which uh, when you victimize someone, they lose every aspect of their character. Um, and so they will become victimizers, uh, or often do become victimizers, because of that loss of support for the kinds of traditional ethical behavior that we, uh, that we expect. So, so we're very dependent on each other. And in the context of prison reform, Bruce Western's work um, on uh, showing that prison itself can be criminogenic, in other words, just because someone does something wrong, if we're going to do something bad to you, that's going to come back to affect not just that person, but all of their family members, all their community members, and it's going to make the entire community worse off, uh, including the people that put them in the prison in the first place. So, uh, so we are all dependent on each other. The second thing that I want to emphasize about this new picture of being human is that everybody has a partial perspective on truth. Uh, we are imperfect. We see only from our own eyes and from our own worlds. And that doesn't mean that we're lying to each other, but it, needs, we, it means that we need to make a big effort to understand the world from multiple perspectives. And in my own work at criminal sentencing, I saw this happen when um, we went to the Connecticut legislature to do sentencing reform for juveniles. And the, um, that, that panel of the Judiciary Committee had only ever heard white victims come into the room. And instead, this time, they were hearing from the families of incarcerated youth. And the entire conversation changed. The entire field changed. There was a completely new understanding of what the criminal justice system was doing. So that, the importance of, of those perspectives um, uh, the, the Phoenix Association in Connecticut is, a, is an association of formerly incarcerated people, and their motto is, nothing about us without us. And I think that's a great like, little catchphrase for that. Everything is perspectival. Everything requires uh, multiple perspectives, multiple narratives. So we're imperfect in our knowledge, and we're dependent on each other, and we have to think about new metaphors of, t of repairing fabric, repairing webs of communities, repairing and restoring those relationships instead of totting up the balance sheet. 
Well, I'm going to turn to, to Mark and Jennifer to ask your definitions, but also it, it, examples I think would be great. So let me just, again, continuing from the earlier panel, the, the earlier talk, make reference to South Africa, because I think that restorative justice around the world really got a push with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. And so what ripple effects you see and what do you mean by restorative justice? So Mark, and who are you? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm Mark. I'm Mark Drumble at Washington and Lee University. Um, Jennifer, uh, let talk a little bit more about the South African example, and I'll get to that. But I think where I would like to start off is the inspiration from Justice Cameron's talk this morning that coincident with South Africa's 1994 mm -hmm. conversation of constitutional construction was Rwanda's 1994 um, internal annihilation. And my sort of first job in law was actually to be a public defender in the prisons in Rwanda following the genocide. And I worked there in a capacity in which resources were minimal, um, the pain was immense, and the pressure to try and reconstruct a society that had become torn asunder both from within and from without uh, weighed very ponderously. And I started off in Rwanda as a public defender with a great amount of faith in the possibilities of penal law, of criminal justice and procedure to actualize a form of societal reconstruction. I was, I guess, trained very well in law school to have enormous amount of faith in law, law almost in a messianic sense, in a reconstructive sense. I left a little bit wiser, and I left Rwanda with a much more nuanced view of the possibilities of courtrooms and jailhouses within the context of massive social rupture. And it was very interesting for me to listen to Justice Cameron talk about the Rwandan context in this particular frame, because it also got me thinking of how do I construct, in my own mind, restorative justice. And in the international criminal law context, it's a little different, I think, than in the domestic context for two major reasons. I think in the domestic context, restorative justice is often seen as an alternative to courtrooms. Mm -hmm. In a vision of what is the best way to try to deliver a sense of justice. In the international criminal justice sense, however, there has been such a push towards criminal sanction as the first best response to massive human rights abuses. And this idea of carceral justice has really attracted an incredible amount of imaginative traction. And the anti-impunity movement is almost entirely layered on the prison, prosecution, sequestration, incarceration, uh, the courtroom, the, the vision of Nuremberg has sort of become this iconic image that fills our space as how we envision justice. But as I've argued in my own work, unfortunately, and this also maps onto Justice Cameron's point about the complicity of the legal profession in apartheid, mens rea style offenses that fully map onto exercises of free will in the context of massive atrocity only capture the tip of the iceberg of why violence metastasizes in the way that it does. So here, I see restorative justice as entering a space that otherwise would be a void, because most of the time, most people complicit, implicitly involved in atrocity, don't fully map onto the ideal type of the criminal defendant that we envision either because it's a child soldier who's been victimized, it's because of sort of administrative involvement, Hannah Arendt's entire idea of the banality of evil. So I think for me to answer your question, in any context, the beauty of restorative approaches and restorative methodologies in the context of atrocity is one of conjunction, it's one of addition. It is to add further layers and levels and sediments of justice 
and to do so in a humanistic way. So I think in my little corner of the world, when I think of restorative justice, it's less an alternative than it's a complement to try and achieve a more honest conversation that so many elements conspire together to create endemic discrimination and atrocity. And if we're only pointing our finger at the handful of individuals who are most responsible, we're neglecting an awful lot of involvement, complicity, and pain. You know, I think your use of the word compliment there is so striking because it's not by accident, it seems to me, that in the negotiations over the treaty authorizing the International Criminal Court, the negotiators stalled over exactly this question. So the jurisdiction, as you've written, as, as you well know, of the court disappears if there's a local in, uh, undertaking, but the negotiators couldn't agree that the local undertaking have to be a criminal prosecution, mm -hmm. or can it be a restorative form? And they left it blank, and they haven't answered it. So the question about its role as a complement, as an alternative, as perhaps the preferred route is still open for discussion. So Jennifer, help us understand what restorative justice means and what echoes there are of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada. Uh, so my name's Jennifer Llewellyn and, and I work at Dalhousie uh, Law School in Canada, the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. And um, you know, I'm struck by the connections in our conversation um, and, uh, and, and my head's full of, of those um, ways in which I see resonance between the domestic and the international uh, applications, which is where I've spent uh, a great deal of my work, um, working on truth commissions and the response to historic harms, but also thinking about those implications for the way we do justice sort of on the, on the everyday in those sort of more st stable, so-called stable circumstances. And, uh, and I think there is a, a propensity to think, to attach restorative justice to the various mechanisms to whether it's the mechanism of a truth commission or to uh, alternatives within the uh, criminal or domestic uh, legal systems. And I think what we're hearing here is the call to think about restorative justice uh, as a different way of thinking about justice, as a, as a way of making uh, relationships or asking what difference it makes, this complexity, this layered interconnectedness, this relationality, what difference would that make to not only the way that we think about uh, law and the role that it might play, the sort of analysis we bring if it turns out that uh, we are relational as human beings and that the world is this interconnected, complicated place. If we stop, if we made that transparent, if we made that obvious, um, what difference would that make to the way in which we would look at law and its structural effects and impacts? And what difference then would it compel us to make in terms of the way in which we structure processes and we respond. And for me, what's really uh, been impactful about South Africa, and I, I looked to the comments this morning uh, by Justice Cameron about it, the TRC didn't do enough. I think that's really insightful, right? Because if we think about restorative justice and the TRC as a model of restorative justice, we have this moment where we're like, oh, well, it didn't, it didn't work. Like, it wasn't complete. Uh, because it was meant to be this process of restoring justice and then being done with it, instead of seeing it as a move to pursuing justice uh, in a different way. And if that's the case, uh, what is profound about it is that it is a job left undone, mm -hmm. but begun. So I think what it sparked for South Africa that, that needs to be an ongoing thing and what it certainly sparked in terms of um, other context is this idea that if we think about justice in these relational ways, that issues that we need to look for context and context um, and circumstances, and that we need to be understanding the interconnectedness of issues and of parties, and we need to be breaking these binary kind of ideas that people are simplistically victims or offenders. Um, if we approach that work differently and try to design and respond with different kinds of processes, that those will have to be enduring changes. And so um, in, in my own context, we've started to think about how to address historic harms restoratively that dovetails with 
and is influenced by lots of the work that uh, Margaret's doing, and think about then how that requires ongoing work. So it can't be, here are the recommendations, uh, please repair. <laughs> it has to be about culture change and about enduring um, creation of processes that are able to do justice, not only in response to wrongdoing, but then promote just relations, right? Think about what that means. And if I, if I pull that back, as I, I know we'll get to in terms of what that means then for us as lawyers, mm -hmm. I think it makes our, our responsibility to work in more collaborative, problem-solving, diverse ways uh, to respond to justice and to maintain that justice work in restorative ways. Much so more challenging. I'm also struck by the commonalities, and each of you have talked about something bigger than what we usually think about in the justice system, and whether it's by reference to structures or history or patterns or relationships, it can get pretty abstract pretty quickly. So I would really like an example. Someone talk about, Jennifer, maybe you'll talk yeah. about a process. Sure. Process. Yeah. So uh, in one of the examples that we can offer that sort of intersects between this domestic example um, and some of the challenges uh, that we see uh, playing out internationally uh, is that there is currently a restorative approach to a public inquiry uh, in Nova Scotia and I sit as one of the commissioners of that uh, public inquiry. It's Canada's first attempt uh, to sort of bring some of that knowledge around uh, truth commissions. We've had our own truth commission about residential schools that also sought to work this way but to do that in response to... schools for First Nations. Yeah. That's right. Individuals. Uh, in response to a school, in this case, an institution um, called the Home for Colored Children, mm -hmm. which uh, opened in 1921 uh, and was um, actually an act of resilience and a significant achievement of the African Nova Scotian community uh, to provide care for their own children in the context of a very racialized uh, um, uh, racist society that wouldn't have provided that care otherwise. And, and that then uh, wound up in not a tragically unfamiliar um, uh, story of institutional abuse over multiple decades. It didn't close until the 90s. Um, and when the former residents of that institution came forward and articulated what their vision of justice looked like, and they did that through a, through a, a civil action, a, a class action claim initially, um, they were quite acutely aware that what they wanted from a justice outcome wasn't going to be available to them through the compensation in a civil claim, nor through a traditional public inquiry where they would be the subject of it but not able to participate in it, uh, and, and was not going to be captured by finding those to blame and being backward looking. And so the image that they created um, was to hold up this idea of Sankofa, which is um, uh, out of a... a um, a tradition in, in Africa, which sim is symbolized by a bird with a, an egg in its beak looking backwards uh, to fetch what is good about the past, what we need to understand and come to know, but yet is flying forward with that commitment to making that truth matter for the future, what matters about it. And they wanted to construct a justice process that did that, and so they wanted an approach to a public inquiry that didn't focus on blame, um, that brought um, collaborative participation of the parties. So one of the tangible concrete differences has been that the commissioners and that sort of council of parties, we call it, that slate of commissioners, um, are drawn from former residents, from those from the, uh, the ongoing board of the Home for Colored Children, those from the community, and those from government. And they work collaboratively in a process that's committed not just to uh, figuring out what happened in the past and making recommendations, but in uh, bringing into collaboration uh, those parties with collective responsibilities so that we don't have to attach responsibility for making what happened in the past matter and making a difference to uh, fault and blame, but to our common responsibility and to taking action in real time. And so that process is in that phase of trying to uh, work collaboratively for change at the moment. Margaret, history matters. But it's also about not just history. That is, restorative justice is not just about the past, right? Can you help us attend to that and in so doing, this issue about victim versus perpetrator, blame, responsibility, how, how do we think about being more complex and yet not losing a moral judgment? Well, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I think uh, that uh, 
thinking about the complexity helps our students. Uh, because, uh, and, it, and it helps to borrow from other disciplines. This is where interdisciplinarity really matters. Uh, because we're used to thinking uh, and to teaching our students that there are perpetrators and there are victims and there are consequences. And uh, when we think about complicity uh, and we think about implicated subjects, uh, it requires us to get out of the frameworks um, that we all, we all are accustomed to, uh, familiar with, and are, there, and, and are there by transmitting to the students. And so uh, I think you know, the, that we need to look, first of all, at uh, psychoanalysis. We need to look at literary criticism, certainly Arendt, Primo uh, Levi, many, many others who've talked about what it means to be implicated in systems of injustice, historical systems of injustice, and nevertheless not be legally responsible. And uh, you know, there's, there's a conundrum there, of course, because you know, if everyone's implicated, then if everyone is complicit, then no one is. Uh, but to get students to begin to think about the way in which, uh, and, and I think Justice um, Cameron's remark, I'm a former judge, and I really related to his remark that every judge is in some way complicit. So no matter how strongly and uh, faithfully you hold on to your uh, values, and he expressed them really powerfully here on the bench, you nevertheless are part of a system that requires uh, some sort of actions that render you complicit. And uh, I think it's really that what restorative justice, and also I would say, Mark, international uh, criminal law, new understandings of international criminal do law, do really create a brand new landscape for our students in, in giving them and, and, and teaching them what it will mean to be lawyers in, in the future. Um, that it's not, not, it's not all taking place in courtrooms. And epistemology, uh, as a matter of uh, epistemology, the ideas about justice are not all coming from people with legal training or even philosophy. Mm -hmm. That they're coming from the ground up. The restorative justice movement started at the ground level, right? Uh, and, it, and it bubbled up. And, uh, and, and so, so to think about uh, where these ideas come from and where students, where students can find uh, learning, where they can learn from, I think is really, uh, really critical um, as, as we move forward. Now, you, you, you asked about history. Uh, our project is all about the embeddedness of history. And I thank uh, Jennifer for uh, this uh, insight uh, that we talked yesterday about our project, our students look at uh, cold cases in the United States from uh, the mid 20th century. And they reverse engineer those cases. Um, they develop the files, they find the family members of the victims, uh, and they create both uh, a, a, a legal narrative about the case, and then they also create a restorative justice um, a, a pro project uh, for the case. Uh, why it works pedagogically is this. Uh, it's experiential, it's clinical in nature, and yet unlike a real murder case, right, where the students are focused on the facts, how they find the facts, how they use the facts, here the students focus not just on the facts, but the structures that, that created the injustice. And so it, 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 it gives them an opportunity to see the embeddedness of history um, in the legal material that they will be uh, working with through, across their careers. And of course, it's only useful to the extent that it informs us about mm -hmm. where we are today, mm -hmm. as Justice Cameron mm -hmm. described. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I, I wonder about other members of this discussion, your thoughts about both this issue of structure and how to make that something palpable, particularly given the way that all of us learned law where structure wasn't very dominant, um, and also this uh, binary of victim and offender, um, and how to 
render complexity without losing moral judgment. <laughs> so who wants to take that one on? I'm happy to jump in, right. um, but to actually to go back to your earlier question about specifics. Right. So in many conflicts that I've had occasion to work with victims and perpetrators in, uh, children are involved in suffering acts of violence and committing terrible acts of violence. So in northern Uganda, for example, the 20-year civil war, is drawn to a close largely, involved tens of thousands of children who were conscripted, some of whom came forward on their own initiative to volunteer in a group called the Lord's Resistance Army. And the Lord's Resistance Army committed terrible human rights abuses under the leadership of Joseph Kony, who's still at large. One of the LRA leaders, Dominic Onguen, who himself was kidnapped into the group at the age of nine, is currently facing prosecution at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. One thing that I have experienced in my work is that sometimes, depending on who victimized or hurt you, you as a person that has been hurt and harmed can become incredibly lonely. And you can become incredibly lonely because every time you speak about the pain that you suffered, if the person that inflicted that pain upon you was herself or himself a victim, a child, a 10, 12, 14 year old, when you speak about your pain that the 14, 10, or 12 year old inflicted upon you, generally in my experience what happens is just like I'm looking at you and I will say this 12 year old amputated, hurt me, killed members of my family, subjected me to sexual violence. The general response of an interlocutor in that capacity will be for you to try to make me feel better by saying the child did not know what he or she was doing. He or she lacked a capacity, was under the influence of drugs, was coerced, him or herself brutalized. In my experience, that doesn't dull my pain. In fact, it may exacerbate my pain because I can't even speak about it without the attention of the room, the interlocutor drifting back to the person who hurts me. So, should we criminally prosecute a forcibly drugged 12-year-old who mangled and mauled other people? No, I don't think so. But if the only thing we see as justice is criminal prosecution, that means that nothing happens in those instances. And to me, in a practical context, and there are plenty of experiences of this from northern Uganda, restorative methods of justice can step in. They can be ceremonial rituals to reintegrate, community conversations or discussions about involvement, development of reciprocal senses of citizenship, rejuvenation, uh, reparative forms, making amends. One thing, Margaret, thank you for talking about interdisciplinary, one thing that I have found works very successfully in terms of reintegrating children who committed terrible acts of violence is drama and music and yeah. art therapy. This is a world that we don't teach in law school and generally lawyers and poetry just don't really mix, right? So I wish, I wish we did, right? So I think this is part of an energy of a conversation, but for me, the motivation behind it is if we only see pain and violence as these most egregious forms of civil and political rights abuses committed by all powerful perpetrators. We're only seeing a really thin slice. And, and to me, that's where the energy comes from to, to try to fill this space, which is a very difficult conversational space and to come full circle. And, and all this, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude my little intervention now. In contexts where former child soldiers return to their home communities. And there is no form of restorative justice conversations. Those children generally tend to become re-marginalized, feared, and the community just doesn't believe that they are all always innocent. 
So I think the responsibility of law is to do more than just have the hammer of criminal prosecution in our toolbox and to think much more subtly in a more nuanced fashion. So for me, that's the challenge. Well, I've learned so much myself from your work on child soldiers. And for me, it's in my current work, I've ended up then bringing it home and looking at treatment of juvenile uh, justice in this country. Because there's this odd paradox that the international rhetoric is, these are innocents, and there should be no use of law. Uh, and indeed, the criminal process should focus on the adults who have brought the young people into war, which is, seems right, I'm for that. But it's, it, it ignores the experience of the young people who know that they've done something wrong and whose communities know that they were involved in something wrong. And yet, paradoxically, domestically, we have no room to talk about innocence or complexity or the uh, coercion or, or complicity of adults in drawing young people into criminal activity in this country. So we just need, it seems to me, to compare these two um, dramatically. Um, I can't resist saying that one of my teachers was Robert Cover, and he told me that he went to law school to make the world safe for poetry. <laughs> so I think that that's just a good thing to recall. Now, Linda, you do a lot of work with incarcerated people. Um, and I, I'd love your insights about how they think about victims and perpetrators and how you think about that. I think that this is, you know, you've lots of resonances here between the international and the domestic context. I mean, not that many years ago, 15 years ago, we were talking about juvenile super predators and now we're talking about, you know, the, the juvenile brain not being developed. So we've, we've done our own kind of three... Evolution. One, yeah, we've had our own uh, evolution about this conversation about are children innocents or are they devils, right? Uh, we've had the same kind of bifurcated conversation. And I have a lot of those students in my classes, a lot of women who were uh, convicted as juveniles, who were involved in gang violence, who were... Um, murderers uh, who uh, have grown up in prison essentially and have very long sentences. And, and it, it, you know, one of the readings that I taught one time was the Zimbardo prison experiment. And boy, they were all over that. Does everybody know what that is? So the Zimbardo prison experiment was when a bunch of Stanford students were you know, divided into groups. Some of them became jailers and some of them became prisoners for, it was supposed to last for, I think, a month and I think it only lasted for a week, if not because it, immediately what happened was the jailers started being very cruel to the prisoners. And it was a, uh, it was a study in authority and how authority uh, is corrupting and how, um, and, they, and they recognize it. They recognize it not only from their own prison experience, but they recognize it from their gang experience. And they even said to me, and there was this one beautiful moment when one of the women said, look, I think that we would do better in that experiment than those Stanford college students did because we've been there and we get it now, and we won't be swayed as much by the peer pressure and by the, the sort of context of violence. Um, so I do think that there's a recognition of responsibility, but also a recognition of we want to give back. We want to tell people. We want to teach people. <laughs> Every single student I've had in that context has wanted to go back out into the community and help other young offenders. Uh, and, and teach them how to, to get through this better. Um, I also think that, that, that your experience, Mark, is really um, resonates with some work by a friend of mine, Jill Stoffer, in her okay. Ethical Loneliness yeah. book, right? Uh, and, and she faults the, the TNC the, for forcing forgiveness on victims and for not hearing their pain mm -hmm. in a kind of genuine and, way. And I think. I also have talked to my students about their own victims, and, and it's interesting because we have these conversations, and they'll, they'll be angry about their sentences. They'll be angry about the representation that they received in the, in the criminal justice system. But many of them burst into tears when they think about the harms that they caused their victims. They want to apologize, and there's no way for them to do that in our system because the the criminal justice system forbids them from obviously communicating with their victims' families or their victims. 
And they aren't able to have that restorative moment, or at least that moment of apology, except in the context of a parole hearing or a sentencing hearing in which it looks like their, their own credibility is, is, uh, is undermined by the fact that they're trying to lessen their sentence. And I think they would really love to have the opportunity to be able to sort of, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a setting that didn't require um, adjudication, be able to talk to about their own um, sense of guilt uh, for what they've done. So yes, you're absolutely right. There's no moment at which that can happen. Now, we've been working on those things. I think some of the, the ways in which restorative justice has come into the prison context is very interesting. We've had this, the Vera Institute has come into the Connecticut prisons and they've established two really cool programs. One is called um, the true unit, it's in the male facility, and one is called the worth unit, which is in the female facility. They're very complicated acronyms. But the basis of them is to provide a kind of complete uh, restorative justice paradigm where you're getting um, vocational education and, and that sort of uh, program, but you're also getting a lot of, of group discussions about crime, you're getting discussions with family members, you're getting mediations, you're getting some victim offender mediation, um, and a lot of it is modeled on the kind of traditional restorative practices. Um, they've had good luck so far, the, the folks that I know in the program, they're, they're using sort of the older prisoners to mentor the younger prisoners in a way I think that's very um, effective and genuine. Um, and it's, they're being informed, I think, importantly, by formerly incarcerated people. I think it's absolutely, incredible, absolutely critical that those uh, folks are planning these, these programs. Uh, in other words, you have to have the full circle of information. Um, and that seems to be a nice way to allow restorative justice a place um, to help reintegrate folks, but also to recognize that the connections between the people in prison are absolutely critical to their restoration. And this has been something that goes against all kind of correctional policy. A correctional policy was you go in alone and you come out alone. Don't make friends, don't make connections. Um, and yet through the classroom and through these kinds of new restorative practices in prison, I see firsthand how important those peer influences are. Um, we know it from our own education, we know it from our kids' education, we know that peer influence matters, uh, and so of course it matters. The classroom is an absolutely critical intervention, and I think it's a restorative intervention, where people have to give each other respect and dignity and listen to each other's comments and take each other seriously. And they end up helping each other with their assignments and they end up you know, trading ideas for uh, papers and they end up having discussions that go much, you know, that are, that are personal as well as, as curricular. And that model also you know, translates to all of the sort of 12-step programs and the, um, and the kind of restorative practices uh, that, that have been introduced by things like the Vera Institute. So, um, so I think that connections between people in prison is, is something that, we, that has happened, that always happens, that we need to actually recognize and support. Jennifer, I saw you. I'm just struck by a part, of, part of our mandate on the panel is to think about what law can uh, do about this. And I think one of the things that's so striking in terms of the theme of building bridges is also um, to spend some time thinking about what law is doing to, to uh, structure our divisions, right? And so these categories, this question about um, what is law doing to structure the ways in which we think about uh, categories and identities of people being either fixed because of the nature of our process and the way that we think about uh, blame and fault and, and how significant and important that is to our dispensation of punitive uh, justice or, or, or even in the civil context to uh, rewards and compensation uh, has actually exacerbated the divisions in the world, the very divisions that uh, bring people uh, into conflict with the law, right, that, that cause a kind of disorder and, and, and violence and, um, and thwart the sort of peace in terms of, a, of the world we're trying to create. And so I think that, you know, fundamentally for my students and for the work I do uh, with others, 
uh, particularly those who've been harmed and affected. Part of, um, part of the task is actually to be able to see the ways in which law and our thinking about uh, the, the, the sorts of legal processes, what justice looks like, have um, fed those divisions and those, that way of thinking that doesn't allow anybody uh, to think in these morally complex ways that are required. Um, and so that's what your students are confronting and seeing. And I, you know, for me, I think part of that's um, made more difficult in terms of the transformation we might be able to see from thinking in restorative ways when we try to fit it in as alternatives or complements or I'm struck by it. There's a scholar, Sue Campbell, who did, you know, was a relational theorist scholar, and she used to constantly uh, be frustrated by people's questions about individualism and liberalism and how, you know, this relational theory can, where how they would dance together. Mm -hmm. And she would just say, like, they're not even on my dance card. Why am I required <laughs> to think about where they are on the dance floor? Why can we not just think differently? just occupy the dance floor differently without having to be partnered with these assumptions. And I think the hope that a, a restorative justice offers us for thinking about building bridges has to be bringing this moral complexity, resisting these kinds of categories that are built into who is a victim and who is an offender and can you be both and um, by, by having us start to think about, well, why are we holding on to those categories? What work are we requiring them to do in terms of justifying our dispensation of punishment or outcomes? Or, and if we are more future focused and thinking about what are our responsibilities for what happens next, we do move to a more problem solving frame. We do have to think in ways that are much more, much more morally complex but that allow people also to enter into the processes in these much more complex ways, right, where they can be authors of the solution. And, and it strikes me that we can't do that if we're not honest about the role that our current ideas of law and legal structures are playing in terms of our pursuit uh, of justice. You know, it's very striking that in some ways restorative justice has seemed like an add-on or a complement or a supplement, and one of our tasks here is to see actually what does it mean to put it at the center. Um, and one of the things that I think it means um, is not always to be asking about that relationship to the mainstream. And at the same time, we do need to interrogate the infiltration of you know, language of guilt and innocence, uh, of, of the past being separate from the present. Um, I, I'm very struck by the challenge that this offers for us as educators, as legal educators. I think that um, probably the first lesson in law school is it's complicated. Um, and the students are so often unhappy about that because many of them say, there's law, I want the answers. And we try to teach about moral complexity. And here, we're talking about a whole other level of complexity, that even the legal system that you're learning can be a tool for justice, and it can be a tool for injustice, and it can actually provide rhetorics that are liberatory, rhetorics that are oppressive. Um, so I, I'd really like to talk more about what we can do to teach, and at the same time to acknowledge that restorative justice is not marginal anymore. Sort of justice is now being taught as a method of discipline in, in schools around all of North America. And it's what young people are learning as their way of solving a problem is to map all of the contributing sources and forces to find someone who's been focused on as an offender and figure out everything that affected that person. And to, yes, sit in judgment, but also develop concrete sol solutions, problem solving courts proliferation of problem-solving courts, pluses and minuses, but one thing for sure, they're much more consistent with restorative justice than retributive justice. Uh, and uh, I, commissions of inquiry, um, uh, Wendy asked Justice Cameron about uh, dealing with uh, monuments. Uh, we're having that kind of discussion, I think, across uh, every major institution uh, around the globe. So restorative justice, is, let's assume, it's not marginal. It's now mainstreamed. What does it mean to teach it? And what are the capacities, disciplines, uh, that we need to bring in? What stance do we need to take uh, about humility and yet also about knowledge? 
So again, concreteness would be helpful, but what, what does this mean for law teaching? I'll jump in, I guess. Um, first of all, I think we should recognize how, how restorative justice has always been there, and we just haven't noticed it. 95% um, of criminal cases don't go to trial, they're negotiated. And in those negotiations, it's not always just about proof or about power, it's also about uh, <coughs> all of the complexity of that particular crime, all of the uh, mitigating circumstances that come into play and so forth. And done right, plea bargaining can be restorative. Um, I think it's not always done right, but there we are. We can talk about how to do it right. Uh, it's the, 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 the place is there. Um, ex exercise of discretion is everywhere in the law. Prosecutorial discretion is always being exercised in ways that could or couldn't be restorative. Um, and we, you know, if we prosecuted every single person who committed every single crime on the books, we would all be in jail because there's so many possibilities for committing or being complicit or being an aider and a better or being in a conspiracy of some other crime. So uh, it's impossible to ignore that, that discretion aspect. Um, I think we need to be more explicit about teaching about discretion, teaching about mediation, teaching about how to have good judgment and how to exercise good judgment in those complex contexts. But they're always there, they've always been there, and they've always been really the center of the legal system. It's just not uh, the part that we do at trial. Um, I think the other thing is that, that law teaching has always been itself somewhat restorative. We supposedly use the Socratic method, which is a method of trying to break down people's preconceptions, break down their um, question, have them do a lot of self-questioning, which is very hard and very harmful sometimes, but also very beneficial. And I have seen students transform over the course of a couple of semesters or a couple of years uh, from folks who thought that it was one way or no way at all to folks who really did listen to the other side, who really had moderated their views on things, who had sort of taken in information and change their, their minds about various really important values uh, systems. So law school is a transformative experience. It is a, an experience in learning empathy. Um, you have to play different roles. You have to see the world from different perspectives. Um, as you guys probably already know about this wonderful article by Jean Peters and Sue Bryant, The Five Habits of Cross-Cultural Lawyering. Um, and it's all, it's all cross-cultural lawyering, which requires you to reflect on the way in which you share or don't share certain kinds of worldviews with other people and being aware of uh, whether you're opening yourself up to listening to your client, to your coworker, to your teacher, to your classmate. Um, so all of those things I think we've already got in the academy and we should we should like them, we should be proud of them, we should think about them probably more than we do, and we should emphasize the, the values that are gained from those practices. It does strike me there's a risk, um, and one of the risks is that we try to do all of this with law students in law school, right? So I think about one of the fundamental shifts our thinking about justice restoratively makes is we start to think about the business of justice is not just the business of the legal system. If we actually want just societies, we need to be shifting to where these sorts of processes live, to schools, to human rights commissions, to workplaces, to, and, and one of the risks when you try to take a group of law students and teach them to do things restoratively um, is that, you know, maybe this is, we, we need humility, right? Or we need to be able to um, equip them to be able to work with others, not for them to be all things and all disciplines, to, but to be, know how to collaborate and work together with others which might mean something for the ways in which law schools imagine their role working across the campus or, or with other um, professional groups, but also other citizen and community groups so that part of the skills they're learning is not to be all of those things, but to be uh, able to work in collaboration and, and play a role in that kind of, of team way. And so I'm thinking about some of the ways in which um, the experiences your students have is not just but what they can do and be the lead of, but how they work with families and work yeah. with 
I mean, I, it's all, it, while it's true that restorative justice has all, always been here, it's also true that, for, that law schools are catching up uh, with um, a movement, uh, an initiative, a way of thinking about justice, uh, and a practice um, that, is, that, that has taken off and um, that is reflected in undergraduates, in undergraduate teaching. So there is, in addition to, uh, it should infuse the ways in which we talk about justice with our students, there's also a specificity of the practice of restorative justice. One of the elements of, of restorative practice, uh, and how do you do it in schools? How do you do it in courtrooms? How do you train probation officers and, pro and prosecutors in these processes so that they can integrate them into their own work? And that's a course. And uh, I think we're not really at the point yet. I, I, don't, I don't know of law schools that have, uh, some law schools, but not enough, have taken this on as, you know, just as we the, begin, began to teach, you know, critical race studies and critical legal studies and new ways of, um, of you know, of, of moving students into um, the work and the practice, certainly this restorative justice is, is in fact, a course. That's on enough, on, really a, just on yeah. a pedagogical front. <clears throat> so when I teach international criminal justice, I include plenty of mechanisms that we would loosely identify as restorative. But I think the way that I try to teach about them effectively is also to unpack the limits of restorative justice. Right? So I, I think pedagogy is effective when it is not ideology. And I think restorative justice has very sharp limits as well. And I try to introduce those in the conversation as well with regards to pedagogy. One is that restorative justice can be extremely coercive. Mm -hmm. So in the, paradoxically, so in the international criminal justice context, there's lots of funders that fund these ideas of reconciliation programs and restoration programs and kumbaya programs. We're all gonna hold hands and get along. But there is also a loneliness, and thank you for bringing up Jill Stouffer, because just the inspiration. I, I yeah. know her, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> there can be a great loneliness there as well. What about the victim who doesn't want to forgive? What about the victim who doesn't want to reconcile? What about the victim who gets hectored and harangued, beseeched and begged by a perpetrator to say that she will accept his apology so that this circle is closed? And what about the funders that love those closed circles? Because then they can exit a post-conflict zone and say, we gave $1 million, and guess what? We effected 987 reconciliations. Right? So this can be very coercive. I think it's important to instruct on so, that. But no more than where you started the conversation, which is the ideology around criminal exactly. prosecution. Exactly. Right? Like, so the this is thing. the limit of tools well, and processes. Yeah, I think of, if, we, if we think... There's nothing germane it, to restorative right. so justice if, done well that does that. Yeah, so if we embrace ambiguity, subtleties, nuance, we also have to apply those to ourselves. Right. Another point, and this is, this is I actually find, when it comes to pure legalism, good old-fashioned legal normativity, I find this is the toughest challenge in the restorative context. You know what? A court is just the place that is the most apt institution to denounce, condemn, stigmatize. Can you have restorative processes over the crime of genocide? Can you have a restorative process over gang rapes that occurred through ethnic cleansing in Bosnia? Maybe some things courts just do right, and that is the power of deontology, the power of condemnation. So I find that a challenge as well, right? Um, and I think there's a third uh, challenge that arises in this context, particularly with an American audience, which is a relative paucity of truth and reconciliation commissions, for example, within this country. After 9-11, a lot strong push was had for some kind of a commission of inquiry over abuses at Gitmo, which are ongoing, and, and in Iraq, Air Force, you know, in Afghanistan. It didn't gel. 
There have been some examples of TRCs in this country, the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission that um, pivoted off of uh, uh, violence in 1970. State of Virginia just created a yes. Truth and Reconciliation Commission following Charlottesville. And, and uh, the Maine Wabanaki Commission, which is quite similar to some what you had described mm -hmm. in Canada. So I think the third <laughs> point with pedagogy is to bring in some examples that have happened in the United States and which achieves, I think, a goal for the students, Martha, that you gestured towards earlier that is even a goal for us, which is some examples, mm -hmm. right, some specificities. But whenever you put a specificity in, though, I also think it's important to teach about its limits. We all have our limits. Well, I think this limits question is crucial, and that's what we should talk about now before we engage everyone else here in this conversation directly. I, I do think that self-critical activity is maybe the, the, the card that lawyers play all the time, that we engage in criticism, but we don't do it enough of ourselves. We don't, don't do enough of our own, uh, our own systems, for sure. And uh, as uh, appealing as many uh, elements of restorative justice are, if it doesn't engage in that kind of self-criticism, then it's not keeping to the spirit that it's mm -hmm. trying to have. So I couldn't agree more. I do think that it's hard to then know what to do with the criticisms. So, you know, there was the New York Times had a wonderful photo essay, I thought, about post-genocidal uh, Rwanda people who were victims, who were neighbors of perpetrators, and they're all in conversation with each other. And then you talk to anyone from Rwanda who says, yeah, funders actually wanted that. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't mm -hmm. real, and how, mm -hmm. how really horrifying it was to have to act out the ceremony of reconciliation. Um, and so I think it's also very troubling to think about who's asked and who's expected to forgive. And why is, it, why is it so often people of color, why is it so often women who are expected to forgive? And where's the forgiveness and self-blame and self-criticism from people who actually have positions of power? I think that those are just central issues. And if you don't have the tools of the formal justice system, how do you go after those who are most powerful. I, I think these are very critical questions, but then what do you do with them? And what does it mean in terms of the competencies that you want law students to walk out with? Right. Because if the competency is just self-doubt, that's not going to be so good either. So I would like some help on that one. Just, quick, just super quickly, on the, that article you're talking about, it's called Portraits of Reconciliation. Yes. I assign it in my Mass Atrocity oh. Seminar. And all of the photos, yes, the, the victim, the person who is being beseeched for forgiveness is a woman and the perpetrator is a man. <laughs> but there is an agency in those photos. Uh -huh. And the agency in those photos is the body language. <laughs> and every semester when I, I, I sign that, the students are like, the women in those photos, they're not, their body language, they are creeped out. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it yes. just, it comes yes. off the page. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think what's fascinating there is even within the frame of coercive reconciliation, there's the human agency for quiet resistance. Mm -hmm. And it, it comes out in those photos. And that, mm -hmm. that's that it's, great. I, I don't stop that's now, great. because it, but it, mm -hmm. it's so nifty that you talked about that. That's great. Because mm -hmm. that's one of the, on my second day of class, that's the article so, I use. So on the question, so I just want to respond to the TRC thing, uh, TRCs in the United States. I actually think that the TRC moment has probably passed. Um, but, but, but having said that, uh, it's also true that what students need to know is that um, the imagination is the limit to the kinds of um, instruments, uh, tools, and um, vehicles through which justice can be performed. Uh, and the TRC certainly offered, you know, a, a very compelling one. As Jennifer says, you know, we could, uh, we, we, w many of us participated in some way. Um, so it was an international engagement and international solidarity. Uh, and it was also imperfect, uh, as are all of our justice tools and mechanisms. Uh, but what the TRC, uh, what, the, what that moment and the other commissions that have followed it, some state sponsored, some individual sponsored, have shown North Carolina, 
um, North Carolina, the, uh, the, 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 uh, yeah. the one in Greensboro, so and so, is that, um, that, that, that we can create what it is we need. Now that's not to say in any way that students do not always need to be mindful of the role, necessity of the state. What is the position, what is the role, in what way is the state participating, right? Um, but I think what the TRC is, that's a state institution, right? Um, so that there are ways in which um, uh, students, I, I, I think it broadens the, the imagination uh, for what. Uh, you know, one true. of the missing lessons, it seems to me, about the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission was it was invented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, then there became an industry to now take its form and distribute it around the world when the point was it was invented, it was invented and right. it was. No, that's exactly. That's, evolved out of community conversations yeah. and development. So yes, I'm just amplifying your point, which seems to me so fundamental. And we should do this well at law school. We, we teach fundamentally, we teach our students. It's about understanding first principles and being able to take those and apply those and imagine how they assist us in understanding different contexts and different circumstances. And so we need to be much better when we're trying to teach um, what this might mean, this way of thinking, of not delinking, right. this way of thinking and understanding and thinking through principled ways um, from the, the models and the mechanisms and the processes and practices in our, in our bid to want to be practical. And I would say this has been one of the big flaws of the restorative justice movement, has been in our bid to want to tell people what it is, is to say, you know, uh, here's a technique. Here's how you do it. Here's what it looks like. Here's the elevator pitch. Instead of here's why it was done that way in that circumstance. And so, it's not that I think there are no limits for some restorative processes and practices. It's that I think the question may be misguided if what we've said is the world is interconnected and relational. We must bring that way of thinking about justice. We need to then be able to be critical of the designs and the implementation of that that have been successful or not successful in the same way as we would bring that way of being critical of the other institutions and practices we have. And I just think it's too easy to say, mm, it has limits. Restorative justice, this way of thinking about justice doesn't work there because that practice might be manipulative. We need to be very careful of coercion and manipulation yeah. and, and of the propensity to fit this as a tool within a box that doesn't question power structures right. and privilege. Right. And right. A, a couple more points, I think, just along those lines. Um, I think there's two things. One is, I think Justice Cameron's absolutely right that we need to be skeptical of power, whether it's financial power or coercive public power. Um, and this was brought home to me when I started thinking about some of my own suggestions for how we should fix the criminal justice system. Um, watching uh, folks just sit in prison for years and years of time made me think, well, why aren't we um, instead allowing opportunities for community service, right? Um, meaningful work, dignified work that will help people be able to give back. But of course, the next day or the next week or whatever, as soon as I finish this article and send it out into the world, I hear an NPR story on the Chinese forced labor in prison. And of course, I know the historical examples in our own justice system in the South and how we use prison labor. So absolutely be skeptical of power, even when it's your power. <laughs> and the second lesson, I think, is really t you have to have, you can't, uh, uh, nothing about us without us, really. Nothing about us without us. You just can't impose these structures on communities. You have to have the communities telling you what it is they need and what they want. Um, the folks that are victimized, the folks that are accused, the folks that are living in this pain and suffering need to be at the table evaluating and inventing these processes. Otherwise, the danger of coercion and manipulation is really high. And I think there's a real danger in the um, restorative justice, transitional justice context, this push to develop these best practices. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the energy behind that is because in our minds, we think the more something looks like law and is law-like, the more legitimate it is, right? So this kind <laughs> of homogeneity is prioritized as opposed to a more heterogeneous approach. But one of the dangers, you know, in terms of power, 
you know, in a lot of post-conflict zones, international non-governmental organizations wield a lot, a lot of power. power. Like we, you know, we think these organizations are are often you know weak or at most have moral suasion. In a lot of post-conflict zones, these organizations have a huge amount of hard and real power. And uh, you know, in Sierra Leone, for example, after the conflict, uh, international funders would come in and would key the amount of money a village got to the number of child soldiers that were there. And anthropologists documented on the ground that communities fibbed about the number of child of soldiers, not because the communities are malevolent, but because everything was so keyed towards this particular funding metric. So I think we need to be careful. And I think, going back to Jennifer, I thought you phrased it really beautifully. In my opinion, we should be comfortable with not necessarily having best practices and really bringing bottom-up perspectives in. I just want to add one thing. Uh, I know our time is running out uh, in terms of uh, pedagogy. Uh, what our students, what I think is particularly inspiring uh, for our students is that they are uh, creating an archive, that what they're doing is real, uh, that they are looking at cases that have not been uh, examined uh, for you know, 75 years. Uh, and uh, connecting with family members who know they lo lost their loved one but don't know how or when or, what, uh, or whether the case ever went to court. Um, and they are uh, therefore uh, adding to our, they're, they're actually creating history. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that, I think it holds real significance for students uh, because st students need, they need cases. They need cases that they think about in the shower and when they wake up in the morning in the way that lawyers do. Uh, they need work that matters. And so the archive that these students are, are adding to is not just, you know, I, I look at it as it, essentially there are three archives. There's the archive, uh, African American archive of lamentation and sorrow in a miseration um, that is uh, legal in nature and literary in nature and gospel songs Physical. in nature. Yeah. And the students are, create, are adding to that and they're also adding to this sub-archive which is started by Ida, Ida B. Wells and others which is just an accounting. These are the bodies, the number one, number two, number three, number four. Um, and they're adding those numbers and those facts and those details in flesh and bone. Uh, and then we have our own archive, which are all these deaths, 2,000 in number from 1930 to 1970, in a particular area of the South. And if the, st and if the students do their work well, um, that will uh, be an enormous contribution uh, and add enormously to our understanding uh, and to the complexity of American and the patterns and the structures. You know, I think, uh, as Justice Cameron said, the Truth, Commission, Truth Reconciliation Commission in South Africa was inadequate, but no one can deny any, that what was done. And so creating that history yes, and that record right. is, yeah. a, is a form of justice. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that, in, uh, that Brian Stevenson's effort to create a museum and a form of community-based commemorization of lynching is another example. And I think it's not a limitation of law, it's what law should be, is to open up to these other forms. I unsuccessfully proposed to the Obama administration a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to deal with financial disaster. It seemed to me, no one's going to jail, okay, but let's have an accounting. Didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But very good documentary films. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. So I think now documentary film is another form mm -hmm. right. of restorative justice. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the tools that I think that law students need to collaborate with. Mm -hmm. Let's invite others to participate in this conversation. Who would like to comment, question, anyone have any examples of what's happening in a law school or community you know? Or, um, comments or questions? And identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm Brian Sayer. I'm on the faculty at Baylor Law School. Uh, we've recently uh, gotten involved, gotten our students involved in uh, restorative justice related pro uh, projects in Zambia, attempting to do the same thing next door in Malawi. Um, but it really, 
related to that generally, but, but more specifically to the discussion today. Um, early on, uh, Professor Drumble, am I pronouncing that correctly? Professor Drumble. Mark is fine. Uh, or Mark. Or Mark <laughs> uh, noted that went to law school um, thinking about law and its capacity to do restorative justice as messianic. All right, and I, I, that got me thinking at the beginning and then reference to gospel songs at the end. <laughs> My familiarity with uh, Rwanda, uh, mostly from the criminal justice aspect, and fully appreciate uh, Professor Drumble's comment that it's gotta be more than that. Uh, you can't prosecute half a million people who were complicit in some way uh, uh, in, in the genocide in Rwanda. Um, but one of the most inspirational stories that, that, that I, I think I've ever read came out of some of those restorative community truth reconciliation projects uh, operated by the community. Uh, certainly not all of them coercive. I don't, don't know if most of them are coercive. Uh, but the story involved a woman and a man, Tutsi woman, Hutu man, part of the same group. They'd been working together for years. They'd become friends. And at some point, uh, the truth came out that uh, uh, she figured out and he figured out that he was the one uh, that basically during the genocide had ripped her baby out of her hands, tossed in the air, and literally uh, hacked the baby in half with a machete. And uh, about the power of the movement that they were involved in, um, and their continuing, not just relationship, but, but friendship. And both of them gave credit to their spirituality, to their religion. Uh, Rwanda is the most, un, not known to many, it's the most Christian country percentage-wise in the world. And those Christian principles of, again, reconciliation. And, and so uh, my question relates to religion as a possible tool in the toolbox of reconciliation. It, you know, I hear words like messianic and gospel songs, but there seems to be a reluctance to confront the, the positive power of religion. We hear so much... And nobody can overstate the power of religion to divide. It, it cannot be overstated. Uh, you can go to topic after topic after topic in these next couple days and, and see the ugly side of religion. Oh, I can't serve, I can't make my cake for this person because of my religion. I can't perform this government service because of my religion. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, okay? But, but anything that has that much power, the power to divide, the power to inspire uh, uh, hatred and exclusion. There's a corresponding power there. Uh, it, it has incredible potential to unite. But before that can happen, I think we have to um, uh, embrace, em, embrace it as a potential tool and not be afraid of the topic. And so that's my question. To what degree can religion, and there's a lot of commonality in the great world religions, and I don't know of a single great world religion that does not value uh, reconciliation and forgiveness and moving on positively. And, and so how can religion be used as a tool? Um, I, I mean, the, the, the communities are motivated. That is a reality. Whatever the ultimate truth is, whatever the true religion is, if there is an, even is one, there is a reality on the ground in this world. And that re reality is religion is a powerful motivator. It can be used to motivate to the negative. It can be used to motivate to the positive. But uh, 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 if, 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 if the leaders are afraid of religion because of its negative potential to use that as a tool, I, I, I don't think we can ever reach the capacity for restorative justice. So, so that's my question. To what degree can religion as a tool and its very common emphasis on forgiveness and reconciliation uh, uh, and humility. Uh, to what degree can that be used as a tool to promote restorative justice? I'd love to yes, comment. Up, yep. I think everybody wants to say something on <laughs> oh, that. Oh, great. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> great. Yes. Uh, so I think that a lot of these movements have been religiously inspired. The Mennonites, uh, Desmond Tutu. Um, there's been obviously an undercurrent of religion in many of the ideas and the conceptions in the restorative justice movement, and, and I think in my own interest in mercy. But I think it's very dangerous when you start talking about using religion as a tool. Um, it, 
Religion shouldn't be a tool of power. It has power. It shouldn't be a tool of power. I, I was going to say that one of the, um, I, I think one of the ways in which um, what you say rings true is that, um, so I root lots of the work I do in restorative justice secularly in this idea of, of a relational theory that's you know, tied to lots of um, understandings that come out of feminist traditions, but I'm also the kid of a United Church minister in Canada, which some people might say borders on mostly just a humanistic movement, but, <laughs> but, but you know, that's... Especially down here. <laughs> that's, that's okay. But I do think uh, that one of the things that's been, that has been very powerful and that we need to be able to acknowledge is that accessing this understanding of the world as, as, a, as relationally connected, as about right relations, uh, is something uh, that unites um, most, if not all, of both the world religions and spiritual movements, and uh, including indigenous worldviews and, and their understandings of spirituality. And that that has been um, um, supplanted um, by a different story, uh, you know, by a story that uh, fits more with capitalist ideals around individualism and. Um, and so there is a way in which uh, there's a powerful opportunity uh, to be uh, tapping into what people know and believe about the world and be able to have that be a productive uh, place from which the, for them to uh, engage in what does justice require and what do we need to be from one another. And so I think that's right, wielding that as a, as a, as a tool um, can be quite dangerous, but acknowledging that that knowledge and that understanding um, it is often rooted for people in very uh, deep and, and uh, informative ways of who and how they understand themselves in the world um, has been undeniably uh, a significant factor uh, in where people are able to move in a different uh, way uh, toward the future together. And, and so I think we need to be transparent and honest about that and where that understanding um, is significant for folks and, and how that does transcend a number of uh, faith beliefs and spiritual traditions and worldviews, almost to the point that one might think it's true about the world. And maybe this other story uh, that we're pretty attached to uh, in our capitalist Western traditions might might be might be less honest about who we are. We'll move on. I I, 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 I do think that's a wonderful question. I can't help but but comment that uh, I had the chance to ask Alex Borain, who was the vice chair of the TRC in South Africa. Did he share Archbishop Tutu's very rich, ample view of a religiously inspired conception of re reconciliation? And he too was a minister, and he said, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. He totally disagreed. He thought it was coercive, and he was very opposed to it. And so I said, OK, so you're the vice chair. What does reconciliation mean to you? And he says, it means to me that when I'm walking down the street and I see coming towards me someone who had been a member of the secret police who sees me and knows my history, we keep walking. That's what reconciliation is. So if there's a pluralist understanding of these concepts and of the religious traditions, uh, that's fine. The problem is if there's a, uh, an authoritative or controlling one. Um, and and that's, that's a balance I think we're talking about generally. Please. So I'm Miranda Johnson with Loyola University Chicago, and we've uh, embedded restorative justice both as part of our curriculum and as also a means for our law students to engage in difficult conversations with each other. Um, the challenge that we're seeing is I focus, my area focuses on school discipline, and um, we have you know, a wonderful restorative justice movement across the country, as was mentioned on the panel. We also have a vigorous, uh, backlash to the use of alternatives to punitive school discipline across the country, uh, most recently shown in the rescission of the federal guidance around school discipline that just happened. Um, so what we're seeing in Illinois um, is kind of a strong movement of our state and of our young people to demand alternatives to restorative justice, or to, to punitive school discipline and to use restorative justice as both an alternative and a complement uh, to you know, school discipline uh, systems. But what our state education agency has told us as we've kind of fought both at Loyola and as part of a kind of an interdisciplinary group called the Transforming School Discipline uh, Collaborative, what our state 
agency has taught us is that there's really not enough social science research that suggests that restorative justice has, um, is effective for it to be considered a best practice. So what we're seeing is the tension between, on one hand, restorative justice advocates and practitioners saying, really, it's a method, it's a process, it's not a rock and a rug in a room, it's a mindset. And then so, so social science researchers who say, we would like to show that it's effective so that we can embed it in educational systems and agencies and you know, even in you know, federal government systems. But to do so, we need a set of um, elements that we can study so that we can see after two or three or four years, is this effective? Is this enhancing school safety? Is this having the type of results that we all have seen anecdotally, but have not enough of a body of literature to suggest it's, it's a research-based, evidence-based best practice? So how do you reconcile that tension? I'm gonna call on Jennifer. Well, I would say, you know, I would say several things about that. One is uh, we've seen in both restorative justice movements and criminal justice uh, and in the context of schools, similar kinds of debates. You know, the, um, one of the things we need to ask is why that is required for an alternative and a different path when we know the current one is so unsuccessful and does not get measured by those standards, right? So, so we don't stop doing all the stuff we know is failing us every single day because it is, as long as it's based on um, uh, evidence, even if that evidence is it doesn't do well, it still gets funded. <laughs> pretty prolifically, and so that's a problem. And I, I don't know how we, I don't mean to be flippant about that, that is, uh, that is a serious challenge. And the other is that the risk, and I think you've identified the risk right, rightly, um, is that uh, we will measure in our zeal to get it funded and to fit within those boxes and to have it seen as legitimate, uh, we bend the goals and the uh, objective of transformation, of changing the way we think and of what we think schooling and the experience of schooling should be about and should produce, which is part of what this movement is also angled at. We reduce it in order to make it legitimate as best practices and, and we measure it by the standards of the current school system or of the standards of the current uh, system. And then we prove that it can be successful by those measures and then the tail wags the dog and then we shape processes and practices and the rug, the rock and the, and the circle around uh, what will get funded. And, and we, we, can de we can demonstrate that's happening in terms of producing exactly the problem you've identified, Mark, that then we replicate these models and practices by what will be funded. And part of that goes back to what you averted to, which is part of the issue is the sort of capitalist um, uh, commodified way in which we're measuring and funding transformation. Um, and I think that's not an accident. I think we, we see a significant push to reduce these to particular practices and particular models uh, because that's less dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Unger, when I was a student at Harvard, used to throw up his hands and say, there are no great revolutions left, right? Because we're all just tinkering at the margins where, where we can do this busy work of transformation that's acceptable because it'll never rock the system. And it feels a little like this desire to make sure these are all practical and knowable and best standards and programs are because you can fund programs and defund programs, you can evaluate them, you can move on from them, and they never rock and threaten the, the institution and the core as a different approach. And I think that is a huge significant hurdle right now and, uh, and it's been really seductive for folks who are thinking restoratively to want to fit into those categories to seek legitimacy, to get funding, to, to make those compromises, to make some difference. Um, and I think that's, that's not an unfamiliar challenge of social movements, but it does speak to what we have to resist in terms of seeing this just as a set of practices or alternatives if what we really fundamentally want uh, is, is significant change in the way we think and work ar around social institutions and, and, uh, and how we structure practices. And so I don't know what the answer to, how do you resist that by questioning, and I think that is a role for scholars uh, to be able to be, to be calling like the emperor has no clothes on this movement around what's the impact of uh, best practice movements and this kind of evaluation and this kind of funding structure. Um, and how do we do that in a sophisticated and strategic way that we don't, you know, sort of um, 
do all of that theory and make no change in the process. And I think that is the, that is the struggle. It's a non-answer, but it's a, a great amount of empathy for what <laughs> so, I, I, That's, I think, a, a profound uh, response. I, I do think where you began is a good place to go, which is, so let's document the, the default system, mm -hmm. the zero tolerance. Let's evaluate that because mm -hmm. it really, you know, needs to be exposed and it, I think it's beginning to be exposed. I also think, look, there's a kind of envy that social science has always had of science. But if you talk to the scientists, they would say, what are you doing? You are elevating these crude measures and the, uh, to really understand that there are methods of evaluation that are responsive, that are participatory, that are attentive to complexity. And believe it or not, I think we should look at business. Mm -hmm. I think that the businesses that are working on culture change, they know this, and they reject very crude measures of social science and outcome measures, and they look at markers inside the culture. And so I think I would put the challenge back and say, let's get the very best evaluations, which don't use crude measures. And it's expensive, but that's what should happen. I, mean, I guess the other thing to say is that um, it's worked for many, many years, uh, this goes back to um, Linda's um, point earlier, that uh, restorative justice, you know, we coined the term as it were, but it's a, it's a process that you know, began many, many, many years ago and uh, in native communities. And um, social science had nothing to do with whether or not they continue to use it in order right. to mediate. Um, their debates and disputes, and uh, and live uh, live successfully as communities. So, that's not an answer either. None of these are answers to you. <laughs> but there are centuries of experience to point to. There is something good. we need to get out of that is that is um, that is I think infecting us even more, which is that we will only value what we can measure, mm -hmm. and we have been. Um, historically very poor at measuring that which we value most mm -hmm. and we should remember that right? right so maybe this is about what what we need to value at our core most and the fact that our a very commodified very capitalist oriented systems of measurement can't capture that that which means most and never has been able to um, we need to be very careful that we don't create these idols of whatever we can measure uh, and we do this. We do this the other way too. When we get good outcomes, when we can measure up, we scream it from the rooftops mm -hmm. and say, "Look how great restorative justice is!" Even if we know the measure by which we got there and and managed to succeed, uh, sh sh we shouldn't be uh, reifying, right? And so mm -hmm. I think we need to be making those questioning that capacity. Um, but I think we should question the put down of anecdote. Because anecdotes are bad if it's just not actually rigorously examined. Right. But case studies that are historically embedded, that look at how this community looked before it had restorative justice, right. and then the processes that were involved in really building up an internal capacity, and then what it looks like now, that's learning. And that's we shouldn't right. dim diminish it. In terms of both um, anecdote and data on the school discipline, points. Um, there's quite a bit of work um, from northern Uganda. I'm not comparing, you know, Gulu, northern Uganda with Chicago. But there's a fair bit of work with how schools mediate, deal with, sanction, approach discipline problems in the schools that are triggered by a war-affected youth mm -hmm. who return home and then have to integrate within a school system. And there is a fair bit of knowledge base there um, that is very attentive to issues of re-recruitment and recidivism, but also has deployed uh, a set of policies to ensure that um, even if children in those contexts present discipline problem, that a sanction should never be the withdrawal or the removal of that child from a learning classroom setting environment. And actually, there's quite a number of approaches that have been quite innovative that have involved community involvement directly within the schools themselves. So there is, if one looks further afield, um, there is a set of, there is a, some kind of a knowledge base that is there that perhaps might be of interest to you. 
you know, that sparks for me the research on trauma-sensitive schools as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, broaden the lens from this violator of school norms to what is this community and what are these kids dealing with, mm -hmm. and then read their action appropriately. And then, again, there's some pretty rigorous studies about when you train the adults in that community to recognize that these kids are actually exhibiting trauma. It, it, things right. change. Mm -hmm. Things right. get much better. And, and trauma is very hard to diagnose in children as well. And That's so, true. but the other thing is, I think just attending to basic needs. So, having a washer and dryer at school so that you can you know, come in clean clothes uh, when your parents are not able to provide that for you, or you know, having meals before you have to go to school. Um, these these are sort of basics, and we just sort of we had a moment of kind of self realization. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, because we were talking about you know poverty awareness week and poverty and you know um, the need for people to apply for for food stamps, and we realized, of course, that many of our students are in that position, and that we should be doing more proactive things for our own students to make sure that they can stay in school. And so that was kind of this moment of, wow, we're not even. I mean, part of this process of restorative justice is being aware of your own limited perspectives and your own othering, and we were othering our own students, or we were not othering our own students, or something was going on there that was very strange. So, um, so yeah, I think there's... Seeing who's there. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Jonathan Stubbs from the University of Richmond, and I just wanted to share um, the, this um, story and ask the panel's reaction to it. As we speak in Louisa County, Virginia, about an hour's drive away from the University of Richmond, there is a courthouse, and there an African-American male is on trial. It's, an, it's a death case. In the court, courtroom, which is about the size of, well, from where the panel sits over to that wall, well, actually from, from this chair to that wall and about to that speaker there, that's about the size of the court. And in, the, in that courtroom, there is, a, there is a large portrait of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, the size of that picture hanging up there, uh, that mirror hanging up there, on the back of the back wall of the court. The judge sits in the front with an American flag over his right shoulder. And there, the, um, in that court, the defense counsel has argued that the portrait of Robert E. Lee must come down because it's a violation of due process. Justice need not, needs to be done, and it ought to be manifestly seen to be done. And it ought to take place in a, in a setting in which there is impartiality exuded by the environment of the court itself. And that there's a separation of powers issue. This is not a question to be put to the voters. The judge and the court is a separate, independent, partial, equal branch of government, and it's the judge's responsibility to take the portrait down. On the other side, there, it's just in terms of complexity, there's an African-American victim in this case. The family does not appear to be particularly um, exercised by the fact that there is a portrait of Confederate General Robert E. Lee on the, on the wall. Their concern seems to be more Someone killed our loved one. We think we know who that person is, and we would like to see a conviction in this case. And so we have all of that going on. And I'm just curious to know the panel's reaction to that type of situation when we're trying to figure out what to do in complicated, a complicated human condition. <laughs> I have, I have two immediate reactions to that. One is um, what an honest and, and beautiful moment to look around that courtroom and realize, like on some level, there's an admirable amount of transparency with that portrait being there because that's probably right. Um, I say gently as your Canadian neighbor <laughs> about why it is that um, we need to be looking for the sets of systemic um, circumstances, so systemic racism and the ways in which these institutions 
come out of a history and trade on the power and authority of that history in ways that if it's not addressed, we should never think uh, that a black man standing in what is still a white ju uh, run judicial system would, uh, would be able to expect, not only be seen to have justice, be able to expect uh, a manifestly uh, just system. And so maybe there's something, uh, a gift in that moment of actually seeing that portrait hanging there in a way that reveals that emperor has no clothes <laughs> moment. Um, you know, I'm struck then by the flip side to that is which is, and how can we then look at what a real justice would mean for the victim's family, for the community, uh, for the man on trial, for those loved ones that are, are also connected to that person and for the community in which that's happening. Um, and, and how could we create circumstances, a context, an environment in which we could focus on what really matters around the questions of justice and the way forward. And that that courtroom, as it's currently constituted and, and maybe as it, you know, um, with or without the portrait, as it's structured, uh, may not be focusing on those sorts of relationships and those sorts of questions. I think what you've offered us is an example of uh, where we don't get at what really matters uh, in terms of the course of trying to do justice. It's a, it's a, it's a very powerful. Um, so what I, what I would say is it's uh, does it, it shouldn't fall on the shoulders of the participants in this court proceeding to uh, create a. a the appearance of justice in the space where justice is being performed. Uh, there's a similar case in uh, Louisiana in which there was a Confederate flag hanging outside the courtroom uh, and the defendants, uh, or the, the, the parties refused to participate in a uh, proceeding uh, in, in that particular space. Um, so this is happening all, all, and with good reason all over the country. We're sitting, we're here in Louisiana where the mayor, uh, Mitch Landrieu, led the process by which led, I should say led, but obviously there was lots of participation across this city um, to remove the Confederate monument. So if you walk, if you, if you take a tour through Louisiana, through, through New Orleans, you'll see um, that Lee is gone and the, uh, the, uh, the general is gone, and those, those, those folks are gone. It will have to happen in our courtrooms. Uh, and the question is, whose obligation uh, is that? And, uh, and it should, you know, so we're here, here we are. It's, it's the obligation of the folks who run that courtroom, the judges who run that courtroom, who make sure that um, jurors are sequestered so that, and uh, treated properly and sequestered, and make sure that there's a, a, wit, a proper witness box and so on and so forth. It's their obligation to make sure that, that, that the appearance of justice is sufficient uh, in order to pre preserve its integrity for all of the parties. That, does, that shouldn't fall on the litigant, mm -hmm. shouldn't fall on the defendant, it shouldn't fall on the victim's family. Uh, so that was the... So says the judge. <laughs> so says the judge. <laughs> Mark, Mark? Well, I, I teach law at a university founded by Robert E. Lee. No, it's true. You so live what a is complex the complex life? Yeah, <laughs> I, and I'm Canadian. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I, I I think this is a beautiful note on which to. I'm assuming I saw like two minutes left. I think it's a beautiful note on which to end, because frankly, I think when we talk about othering, othering happens all the time, and I think one in the, one aspect of our lives we often fully other is our own place within a system, so whether it's running a courtroom mm -hmm. or my own complex life teaching law. At, I teach law at a place founded by Robert E. Lee. And we have had a very vivid <coughs> internal conversation, a beautifully elegant, forceful, thoughtful report by a commission on institutional history and community that has offered a broad array of deeply restorative mechanisms in which to think about that particular legacy with a view towards constructing and reconstructing and restoring a future. And just listening to your question and, and listening to your point now, I, 
I think I'm going to go back and speak to the two chairs of our Institutional History Commission and perhaps suggest that they share some of their acquired knowledge mm -hmm. on how to deal with legacy with us internally mm -hmm. to that particular courtroom. Now, I want to just, let me just say one other thing, which is that, uh, and this takes us full circle to Justice Cameron's uh, remarks earlier this morning. I don't know how many of you have ever visited the Constitutional Court in South Africa, uh, but the court is uh, intended to be uh, the, uh, the place where the post-apartheid symbol of justice uh, in every way, and also ju not just Justice Cameron, but Justice Sachs and all of ju the justices have made sure uh, that it's imbued with art that reflects the struggle in South Africa to bring um, democratic ju forms of gem democratic justice, imperfect though they may be, um, to that country. So again, South Africa points the way for us in so many ways, notwithstanding, as I said at the very beginning, um, that you know the, the, the vast differences in that country um, still exist and still stand as, uh, as a, a shocking reminder that no matter how uh, careful we are in our endeavor to respect the rule of law, uh, you can still have enormous injustices um, that affect the, uh, the, fu the, the futurity of uh, certainly Afri African peoples and, and others across the, across the globe. You know, that was such a powerful uh, question, and I'm sure we'll all be thinking about it. I'm very struck by how the responses are restorative responses. To broaden the circle of responsibility, to ask not just those in the courtroom, but others who have contributed and who could have responsibility now, not in the sense of blame, but in making a change, and um, comparative across one institution to another, across one country to another. And I think those are the kinds of attitudes that restorative uh, approaches bring. So I want to ask you to join me in thanking this wonderful group of people.